I asked the question before that if there's an allegation that someone made a statement, someone made a statement that wasn't true, and another person said that it wasn't true, what responsibility does the police department have to look into the report in its entirety or just some of it? So I'll give you an example. If someone said that I made a statement and that statement was not made by me and that person that made the statement said that it wasn't true, is there an obligation in the police department to interview me, that person, and the law enforcement officer that's trying to find out whether or not that statement is true? If there is a statement made in a report that says that I intimidated someone, what's the obligation for you to thoroughly look into this particular serious matter of intimidation? What obligation do you have to me to properly investigate it? And the fact that this January 10th incident happened the way it did, things were stated about me that were absolutely not true, and I attempted to try to resolve this issue because my name was attached to it, I'm really disappointed the way this whole thing was handled. And if this is how you're going to handle selecting the police chief, we're in big trouble. Now, I have since found out that this report is closed, but what I can't seem to get anyone to understand, and Ms. Seymour, you were involved in it, you actually made the report. What I can't seem to get anyone to understand is that whether it's closed or not, whether you thought enough of the story, whatever, to pursue the issue, my name is attached to something that is absolutely not true. And what I can't figure out is you grabbed me and you pushed me and you attempted to push me out of a room, and this happened January 10th. Now, if the situation was reversed and I did that to you, I would be in jail. You were not in jail. No one really asked you about that. What they basically said or what I was told was that you were trying to guide me to the door. Now, at my age, do I need to be guided to the door? Absolutely not. Do I need to be shown what a door looks like? Absolutely not. But if you felt at that time that there was an incident that you couldn't control, you should have called the police. They already have my name on alert, which I think is sad, and it's an abuse of power. But you didn't do that. You didn't call the police. You attempted to police the situation, and that's not right. So we need to get down to the real nitty-gritty. We need to determine who we're going to pick for a chief and do some serious checking. Thank you very much. The next request is for you, counsel, is a request from HWG Investments, doing business as Hurricane Grill and Wing. They are requesting to transfer the ownership from Top Gun Fuel, LLC, which is a Class C liquor license located at 2985 2 Northwestern Highway in the city of Southfield. All the necessary paperwork and documents have been received by the appropriate department and have been signed off. All the taxes and water bills are paid in current to date. The petitioner and the attorney, John Carlin, are both present to answer any questions that counsel may have with reference to the liquor license transfer. I'm John Carlin, the attorney for the applicant. Basically, this is a transfer of a liquor license into a former restaurant, which was a Hurricane Wings and Grill place. The landlord, or the tenant, the former owner, ran into some problems and left. The landlord brought in Mrs. Desmar to continue the same kind of business. Mrs. Desmar is the owner of the restaurant. She's the one that's been 
kind of an operation that's there. It's a food service establishment. It's not that large. Um, there's no entertainment, nothing of that nature. It's strictly food. And alcohol. I, I didn't hear the last part. And alcoholic beverages. Okay. Um, if you pull the mic, since you're going to be doing most of the speaking, I think, I, I can't, yeah, that would be good. Pardon me? Nothing, I just, okay. waiting for Anything else you'd like to add? No, I don't think so, unless anybody has any questions. All right, counsel? Mr. Fertassi? Yeah, uh, whoever, John, or your client, I, I this license uh, <coughs> went to uh, Hurricane, one of our few licenses that we have the city and um, uh, and so I was very concerned about that license being granted uh, because we have it was kind of uh, set aside for something open across the street that would bring some economic development to the area and uh, but anyways uh, council see the wisdom to to grant this license uh, my first question is, how long has Hurricane and the previous owner been in operation? Um, how long has that uh, the uh, former owner there? It opened uh, uh, last October. October. Mr. Asmar is the uh, owner of the building. It opened last October. So it hasn't so been a full year yet? It's been 13 months now. Oh, I'm sorry. It's still in the days. I tell you, it's been 14. No, now it's okay. 14. The, 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 uh, the license was granted to whom? You're talking about the former license. Well, I'm trying to follow the tracking of yeah. the license that was given to the previous owner of Hurricane <coughs> and trying to figure out how where, where this license is and how it was transferred. Uh, it, the transfer in this thing said it was a dollar. Uh, it doesn't show that it was a... Uh, well, this is a... What? The reason it's a dollar is because they owed Mr. Asmar a lot of money from uh, rent that they didn't pay and other issues. And so rather than putting a dollar value on the license was, or whatever, they just made it a dollar, one dollar, and transferred and forgave them the debt. So the license was was sold to this individual in lieu of payment? Well, he owed, was given. They owed them a lot of money. Well, I understand that. couldn't pay for it, so... No, I understand that, but I mean, I'm just trying to track this license because it was a very special license that was granted as far as I'm concerned. I believe it's the same license. Well, yeah, but it was a, like I said, a $1,500 license. And, and most licenses go for 60 to 100 some thousand dollars. So I'm just trying to track the value of, of the 13 months while we give a license. And then, then it is supposedly they went out of business and there's a value on the license. I'm trying to figure out if the license was purchased with the equipment that was owed, or is it rent that was owed? I see the payments of the rental in this case is like $4,000, dollars a month, and it goes to $5,000 a month. And, and I'm just wondering <coughs> about the, the value that was placed on that license in the, in the, in the, in the uh, transfer. Uh, 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 John, if, I, if you don't quite understand what I'm saying, I mean, I'm going to say licenses are not for sale. I mean, th you know, I mean, I think the license should have gone back to the city. If they they went bankrupt, they went bankrupt. The license should have come back to the city. I don't believe unless they went somebody had an agreement. I don't believe they went bankrupt. Mr. Asmar indicates that they owed him in excess of a hundred thousand okay. dollars. Rather than getting into a long litigation, the other owner goes into bankruptcy. It's delayed for a long period of time, could be years, and there's no tenant in there. It's vacant space. It's not good for the mall. It's not good for the building. It's not good for the city. They came to an agreement with them that said, just give us the license, give us the furnishings that are in there, 
we'll let you go and we'll take over this business and run it. And that's what we did. If we were to put in there that there's $100,000 for the liquor license, then they would have to come up with verification of the liquor commission yeah, where they have the hundred. Well, they're not going to pay the hundred, so we didn't do that. We just put it in for a dollar, um, and that's the consideration. In addition to the hundred thousand that was owed to them, that they're that's not the going to get. That's the value of the equipment that was in there. It's not even it's just over a year old. I, well, if you take the equipment out of there, it's worth not much. And the liquor licenses today in Oakland County are not going anywhere near 100. In fact, they're not even going at 50 anymore. And 50,000 is still 50,000? No, they're 40 to 45 right now. My experience I was just concerned, John, because that was a... I understand. It was one of your quota licenses. Came and, right. and, and, uh, but at least it's staying here. It's no, not being transferred into Troy or some other place. It's still here. It's still being used in the same building you approved. No, I understand. It's just different owners. I understand. I'm not trying to give my heart rate a go. I'm just trying to yeah, try no, that that was given at uh, you know, was no cost. It's a big difference between 1500 and 45000 Well, you know, it's the value is it's there, the value is in the license. You know how that goes. You know, you sell, you sell uh, ice cream uh, cooler along with the license for 45000 You know, you can't sell much. But anyway, okay, I was... I just seen the dollar deal. I was wondering what the what the uh, relationship was between the new owners and the and the old owners and uh, not a good one. And who is, there's a management agreement here now. Is that there was a management agreement with them it? so that we could continue the operation while it took the liquor license period to transfer. So who presently is is that the liquor license? Presently, it's still in the name of the. The former, the one you gave it to, yeah. okay. subject to this agreement and, uh, with the management that Mrs. Hyatt, uh, Mrs. Asmar has. Okay. That's all, Madam Chair. Thank you. On the top. Thank you, Madam yeah, Chair. Uh, so, when the when the I guess the uh, transition was from one owner uh, of the of the Hurricane Grill to the other, it was a seamless transition. Did it close? Did, were there any infrastructure needs that that were needed to be met, or was it just a seamless transition? Uh, from him to the new... Well, it was fairly seamless because <coughs> there was no money that had to happen. Okay. Uh, we have not actually closed. No bill of sale has been signed yet. Uh, we can't do that until we get your approval in the liquor commission. So you're attempting to run just the same business, just not, oh, yeah. not incur any debt to yourself now? Right. And we kept the same employees. I mean, it was just okay. a seamless transfer. Um, kept the place in business. Okay, that's fine. From the beginning, I know uh, what has taken place in reference to Hurricane and everything else, and I have no problem in terms of the license. Thank you. So, uh, is there a request uh, for a new No. All right. Thank you. Uh, I just along the lines of Mr. Moss, um, is anything different going to be different uh, uh, um, with the menu or the operation, hours, anything? No, uh, there'll be nothing different. They, can, they can't change the menu because it's a franchise operation. Okay. The menu is provided by the parent company, the uh, franchise owner. Um, well, I've driven by, haven't been in, and I saw business going on, so um, I'm surprised to uh, get this request that the former owner didn't make it. Uh, we, uh, as Mr. Picasso indicated, we put faith in that person. So did he. Okay. Anyone else? Um, with this
Chair. Um, as you may recall, the city received a, a grant from the uh, Energy Efficiency Conservation Block Grant through the U.S. Department of Energy in 2009 to uh, make uh, various capital improvements for energy efficiency. 90% of the uh, funding was, was allocated towards these capital costs. However, a small portion was dedicated to prepare a non-motorized pathway and public transit plan. And we're here tonight to, uh, in the, our initial stages, to give you a brief uh, introduction of where we are today. <coughs> and we will be bringing this back to the council sometime next year for additional workshops and study, and then hopefully a, an adoption. However, to date, the Planning Commission and the Planning Department have held two preliminary workshops with key city departments and stakeholders, and we've had one public input session. To uh, help facilitate this initial phase, the city has retained Norm Cox, president of Greenway Collaborative, um, who has worked on several of these energy efficiency block grant projects in other communities. Uh, shortly, he will give a brief PowerPoint presentation to the council, and then uh, we would be happy to answer any questions that the council may have. Also tonight, we have the assistant city planner, Jeff Spence, and Mike Mason, who's an intern with Lawrence Tech uh, University, who's assisting us on this plan. And before I turn it over to uh, Mr. Cox, uh, I want to read a quote from the Michigan Governor's Council of Physical Fitness, Health, and Sports. Active living environments are places where all people are able and inspired to use their feet to get them places. They are places where people of all ages, incomes, and abilities can walk and bike both for recreation and transportation purposes. So what is a transit plan and why is it important for the city of Southfield? For our purposes, the transit plan will include a review of existing and proposed non-motorized pathways and public transportation. Developing a transit plan for the city is important for the following reasons. One, to encourage an active and healthy lifestyle, to reduce fossil fuel energy consumption, to provide a more pedestrian friendly and accessible environment, to improve safety for pedestrians, to link destinations through non-motorized pathways, to foster economic development, to increase the use of public transit facilities, to increase the quality of life for residents, business, and visitors of Southfield, to leverage state and federal funding sources, to offer mobility options for seniors, persons with disability, and low-income families, and finally to create a sense of community by encourage, encouraging pedestrian interaction. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Cox, who's going to do a brief PowerPoint presentation, and then uh, myself and Mr. Cox and the rest of the team will be happy to answer any questions that come to may have. Mr. Cox, would you give your name and the rest of the record? Sure. Uh, my name is Normie Cox. I am with the Greenway Collaborative. We are located at 205 Nichols Arcade in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I'll pass around some cards for those of you who can see later. Can you all see if I can you need me close to the microphone? Uh, or my you're, doing, you're fine. Is it connecting larger or is that stopping? Um, we can move it back a little bit if that would be helpful for everyone. Or we're just trying to avoid getting people's way. No, that's fine. That's yeah. fine. Um, did you give me a thing to put on your list? Yes, she has one. Yeah. Okay. Before we kind of get into things, there's often the question of why are we really doing this? And Terry touched on a lot of this. Really, it's a means to reach a consensus of the community. What is the best way to handle non-motorized transportation and transit? How do we go about creating a logical framework to take the ideas forward? How are you going to promote physical fitness? We want to improve the quality of life for the residents. And really also looking at the safety of the bicyclists and pedestrians. You have heard on city council, I'm sure the buzzwords, healthy livable communities, cool cities, smart growth, safe routes to school. These really all have a common ground in improving the bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. Now, <coughs> we talked about safety. If we look at 2004 through 2010, we had 129 pedestrian crashes, 10 of which were fatal in the city. 
21 of those were incapacitating injuries. 101 bicycle crashes, three of those incapacitating injuries. So we have some safety issues we need to address, and you can see the kind of the maps over here. And one of the key things to making this work is the idea of complete streets. Uh, complete streets, in a nutshell, are planned, designed, operating, maintained, so that they work for all users to safely and comfortably both move along the street and get across the street. And it's not a singular aspect, it's the idea of streets creating a network. When we're talking about users, pedestrians, bicyclists, transit, motorists, uh, trucks, and a whole range range of people. And one of the things that we, we try to stress is there's really no such thing as a typical pedestrian or bicyclist. Start thinking of the ages, the range of ages and educational skills, physical abilities, travel speeds, you know, there's all kinds of different bikes. So we have to look at this. It's, it's not a simplistic one solution uh, scenario we're talking about. For example, when you think about bicyclists, you can consider there's maybe four different type of bicyclists we're looking at. Uh, one, a strong and fearless, these, the, the lycra crowd, if you will, who can bike anywhere and any time. They're comfortable going out on the busy roads. There's another group called enthused and confident, about 7% of your population. They frequently bike, but if they're going to go out on your main roads, they want something like a bike lane. Then, you know, a big percentage of your population, maybe 60%, they're interested, they're concerned, they like the idea of a walkable, bikeable community, but if you go put a bike lane on the main road, they're not going to go on it. They're just not that comfortable. They're more comfortable on the local roadways and on trails. And so <coughs> how do we serve all these populations? Now, there's a third of your population that thinks this is all crazy talk and they, they'll never bike anywhere, but if you could address, you know, bicycling for two-thirds of your population, you're doing pretty good. For how do we serve these different groups? Well, there's a bike lane. It's the idea if you have a designated travel lane for bicyclists, it's delineated by a solid line, and the key aspect is the bicyclists travel the same direction as motorists do. They operate as a vehicle. It's about five feet wide is the minimum. As the speeds get higher, uh, you make the bicycle lane a little bit wider if you have room. Most people feel very comfortable going in these at the speeds are in the 30, 35 miles an hour in decreasing number at the higher speed. So we're kind of trying to get that enthused and confident bicyclist. Of course, there's the roadside pathways. These are all around Oakland County, uh, where it's a pathway that parallels the roadway within the road right away. But there are some issues with these. There are conflicts at intersecting with motorists at intersecting driveways mixing bicyclists and pedestrians. It's actually crashes between those two are a little bit more common than you think. They don't always get reported. Um, how do you get from over here to the store or a restaurant on the other side of the street? There is no good way to get across there. Uh, but they're very comfortable for people as far as their interaction with motorists. One of the things we always try to point out is what is it like to bike on a sidewalk or a side roadside pathway versus a bike lane? So the real issue we always find is motorists aren't looking for bicyclists, especially those going opposite the flow of traffic. This person, you can see the right blinker on there, they're trying to look for a gap in traffic. They're looking down the road here. This was a near miss. This wasn't staged. The bicyclists had to do a quick swerve, otherwise they could have broadsided this car. This is where we see a lot of bicycle and pedestrian crashes. Um, so the bicyclist now has kind of, by default, Technically, they may have the right of way because the stop car's back here, but in reality, they're having to stop for all the cars looking to get out of the intersecting driveways. If they're in a bike lane, they're operating as a motor vehicle, it's right where the motorist is looking. So it's all about setting up expectations. Now, <coughs> if you're not comfortable in a bike lane, that's 60%. Um, we use these things called neighborhood connectors. Uh, you already have for them uh, bike lanes, or excuse me, bike routes, uh, where you have some signs kind of telling people how to navigate around the city using some of the local roadways. Well, if you combine those with pathways and start to sign them, right now it says bike route. And the question is, great, where to? Uh, there's some new signs, the size of a street sign that basically say, Here's your destination. 
for bicyclists and pedestrians to a mile and a half this way and directs you to the turns. It's a little bit of an incentive and say, hey, you know, I never knew I could walk down or bike down to the library. Um, and kind of encourage people to take low volume ways to get through the neighborhoods. Connect those up with some off-road pathways and maybe you could find some ways to get someplace more direct walking and bicycling than driving. And so this is also a great way for people to get comfortable with their bicycles. For pedestrians, the key thing is direct travel. Pedestrians do not go out of their way. Um, <laughs> you figure that you know a quarter or a half mile is your typical trip to the store. If you have a sign directing you to go a half mile down to the traffic signal, does that happen? No. And, and this, you can tell how well that sign was respected. Um, so we need to think about when we're trying to accommodate pedestrians as kind of yeah, they'll go maybe 10% out of their way to get a nice safe crossing, but you just can't ignore the demand for the crossing and tell them, hey, go down to the signal. You have to see the problem and work with it. And we did a little analysis of the city and these little yellow sausages. We started looking at the land use, the bus stops, and how the distance is between signals. And we said, you know, these are places where we see that there's a likely demand for people trying to get across the roadway. Uh, that it's people probably aren't going down to the signalized crosswalk right now, and these are areas that maybe we should look at. And how do you deal with that? All kinds of typical solutions, are, but you vary them on what's going on. Uh, there are some signals now that put flashing beacons under standard signs that are only operated when someone's there trying to get across the street. They really get the motorist's attention. Um, crossing islands, where a pedestrian will cross the road in two stages. They look for a gap in traffic in one direction, go across, they stay in the island, and then they look for a gap in traffic the other way and cross. Very simple, no interference with motor traffic, and, and that island there in the middle is a huge awareness building for the motorists that, hey, I need to keep my eyes open. Something unique is happening here. You've probably seen some of these along the Crinton River Trail up in the Rochester Hills and Auburn Hills area. Mm. They're becoming more and more popular. They are always quite well received by the communities. There's some new things called pedestrian hybrid beacons for where those don't work, where you start getting motorist attention with a flashing yellow, bring them to a stop with a yellow, solid red. Pedestrians can get across. And then, what's nice is it goes to a flashing beacon because it's a big road and some kids zooms their bicycle across there. You're not wait holding traffic up forever. The motorist can see that, hey, uh, someone is cleared there, it's flashing red, I can now proceed safely. So it minimizes uh, interruption to the motor vehicle traffic. So how do you bring all these things together? Well, these blue lines might indicate the idea of these neighborhood connectors. And where the neighborhood connector might hit a busy street, you would have those <coughs> crossing improvements and things such as bike lanes on the main road. Now, not all main roads are created equal from a bicyclist or the motorist standpoint. Some of these roads are more important for bicyclists and pedestrians. And so we looked at that, that there are some corridors that we really want to maybe focus bicycle and pedestrian improvements on, make them very comfortable for pedestrians and bicyclists to both move along and across. Now some of them are pretty good right now, other ones are rather challenging, but maybe this is the framework to kind of improve some corridors. You would do have elements such as bike lanes and sidewalks, crossing islands, planted medians, street trees, four to three lane conversions, narrower travel lanes, something where the road feels more comfortable to travel at 35 miles an hour. Uh, I see the officer back there, and you, you could ask him, which is easier to get people to slow down? Do you post the speed, or do you design the roadway so it's just driven more naturally at the speed you want them to do? Um, so if you design the roadway where people naturally drive it at what your targeted speed is, then if there are the differential between pedestrians and bicyclists and motorists is lower, and you could actually make some just beautiful streets that really reflect well on the community. We have done some preliminary mapping of these neighborhood connectors, excuse me, um, also talking about neighborhood connectors, we've done some preliminary mapping and you can see
kind of like a secondary system that's between the mile roads. It uses local roadways, shown in these blue dots, and some potential new pathways in the green, making it easy for someone to navigate about the city, get to your schools, your parks, your civic center. And I look at this as a way to say to your 12-year-old, hey, get yourself to your soccer lesson or your <laughs> soccer practice. Um, you know that they could go on low exposure, get across the road safely, and have a way to get around town. Uh, so we try to create a complete network. There's a few fit bugs still to be worked out and checking on some things. And these neighborhood connectors are taking your basic roadway and adding elements, maybe as many roundabouts, curb extensions, wayfinding, street trees, making these very comfortable. Um, you may have if you want an environment very friendly, you want it to be very focused on the bicycles and pedestrians, you may even bring in green street technologies like permeable pavements along the curb line. And the key, again, is some of these wayfinding signages. And everyone thinks, like, oh gosh, that's a lot you're asking to do for all these neighborhood connectors. But you start out very simply. Just take your typical roadway. <coughs> Start first phase, the bike sign, bike route signs, bike and pedestrian route signs, maybe some basic painted pedestrian improvements to help people get around. Maybe at time if cut through traffic is an issue, starting to add some uh, traffic calming, curb extensions. If you want to turn it into a first class, you could create like a neighborhood greenway. Take some of these where you can get rain gardens and permeable pavements and make it a very nice street where someone say, hey, this is a, a great way to go explore the city. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's something you could integrate into road resurfacing projects. And the key is to tie these neighborhood connectors into crossing improvements. Right now, it may be very easy to get through your own little neighborhood between your one-mile grids, but what happens when you come out into the mile road? How do you get across the road? So you would have crossing improvements to make sure you get across. Um, you know, we don't have everything figured out exactly which solution would go where, but more of a palette of road crossing improvements. And then we want to tie this into transit. You could create super stops or super bus stops where these neighborhood connectors come out to the main road. People have found that if you build <coughs> shelters, have different amenities, uh, like the route signs and maps, the people go a little bit further to the bus stop if they know they have a dry place to stay and, and wait a few more minutes. And you could tie these into the um, neighborhood connectors. And then we took a little look at things. I said, well, of all these ideas of improving the main roads and all these neighborhood connectors, what would be a backbone look like? And what should you maybe your focus <coughs> on? And we kind of highlighted <coughs> that green and it's a fairly coarse grid. You have you know, some improvements already on Civic Center Drive, uh, some other elements that are kind of out there already, but create a system where people could get through the main destinations in the city and focus your energies on this. Again, the easy way to do this is not starting from scratch, but integrating it into a road resurfacing project. Uh, you could do some very low cost things at signs, but a target of this for the kind of the near future. Now, I think Terry described that this is kind of a rough vision, kind of setting some directions. We've identified there's certain areas that need a, a more detailed look at things. The mixing bowl, um, I don't think could be described as particularly bicycle and pedestrian friendly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> feel friendly. <laughs> and uh, at least I'm not the only one that feels that way. Um, some parts of Telegraph where we have the kind of a lot of the commercial activity and along Eight Mile. How do we kind of get between uh, the Civic Center and Lawrence Tech and getting across Northwestern and down here in the Cornerstone area? There's a lot of pieces, if you will, where you know you have universities, we have stores, we have the, the origins and the destinations in close proximity to some of these places. How do we capitalize that? and make places that where people say, you know, I'm going to walk there. I want to bike there. 
especially with like your students at LTU, as you start to get more in the residential uh, situation, how do you take Lawrence Tech from being an island to integrated into a community? So what are we going to do next? Well, um, beyond the visioning, we want to kind of go and look at some of these corridors a little bit more specifically. We have some concepts, but uh, more detail what's possible. Uh, look at some of these trail options, uh, there are wetland issues we need to look at, field check all these routes. We always go bike and walk these things to make sure they work and get some more feedback from people. Uh, with a lot of the freeway crossings, we've taken a preliminary look at some of these. Uh, some of these can be improved with fairly minor improvements uh, for bicycles, pedestrians. Uh, what's the most appropriate road crossing issues, uh, policies for the city? How do you go about your ADA and your maintenance and then for the school, how the school transportation handled? Um, how are we going to take this idea and reach out to the public and say, okay, we're going to build it. How do we encourage you to use it and how do you find the ways to get from your, sto from your home to your store and that kind of outreach? And taking your existing strip development and how does that transform over time with each redevelopment that comes in front of city council? to make it a little bit more bicycle and pedestrian friendly. So I want to do just kind of a quick run through, and we'll turn things over for questions, and we've got as um, much time as you would like. but for bicyclists and pedestrians as well. 
And we're also looking at uh, working with SMART and DDOT on um, pedestrian <coughs> improvements at the bus stops. Uh, in or, uh, early October, Myron and I were at um, the National or Michigan Municipal League meeting, and the whole theme <coughs> was place, offense place, and I think that this ties into into a sense of place. Um, we got a lot out of that. Thank you. Yeah. First, I would like to know the definition, and I think the legal department can answer this. What is the city? Who is the city?
plan, you show me a roadway with a white strip, and you're taking part of the roadway for the bi bicycle use, right? Right. Well, how can you shorten the roadway? Isn't there a, uh, a minimum <coughs> footage in a roadway? You're taking away three, four, five feet from that roadway from the automobiles. How can you do that? Mr. Cox, I can't try to do that. Is there any protocol to entering or to the chair? No, go ahead. Okay, just tell the truth. Right. Do the chair. Uh, we, when we work with cities, you, we typically do an analysis of what is the existing roadway. You look at the number of lanes in the roadway, what is the capacity, what is the width of the roadway. Now we haven't gone this far with uh, the city here, we have, again, as Chris explained, it's been very high end, but the next step would say, you know, you have excess lane capacity. And we often find, we work with cities, that we could take 60% of their primary roads and add bike lanes for the cost of paint with no impact to motor vehicle safety or capacity. And how you ask, how do we do this? Well, a lot of these roads are overbuilt. There's been studies saying that a lot of these lanes are 12 feet and over. You could narrow those lanes and still be safe and comfortable, and there's been studies backing this up. Four-lane roads oftentimes operate safer. Not oftentimes, it's, it's almost a document fact. Operate safer as a three-lane road at the same capacity because you avoid the weaving with the four lanes and someone stopping to turn left and all this. Uh, so there's some roads that may make more sense from a three-lane, just from a motorized standpoint, and the bike lane's a buffer. Uh, some, uh, if it's shorten, a rural... Shorten your answer. Okay. I understand what you're saying. Okay, so there are opportunities to work it in within the existing roadways. The well, I think they're on fantasy land. Because when you put a little roadway in that roadway, and the motorists are going down at 35, 40, 50 miles an hour, somebody's going to get hit and somebody's going to go out of that area, of their area on the road and pick up a bicycle. It happened on 12 mile road. You're in Greenland. I don't think, isn't there a law that you can't uh, shorten the width of a roadway? Roadways were built with a certain uh, width, and they can't be shortened. Mm -hmm. Chair, uh, none of this will be executed that has a danger factor or that's inappropriate either for safety or according to the uh, road design regulations. So there, it's a fair question to bring up, but uh, that will not happen. It isn't at all. So it's not going to happen overnight. It's when a road gets redesigned or redone, like South Road Road, then maybe... It's a long time. Yeah, yeah. it's a long time. First of all, I'm asking relevant questions about yeah. what could happen. But I, I, I'm trying to tell you that this isn't all going to happen at once. Well, I don't think it's going to happen for years. No, it won't. Because it's going to, we know it's going to cost more than $10,000. We know it. Okay. Now, the concept is good. I like But when you say a bike path, I go for it. But when you say all the extra hitting on the transportation and getting down the cornerstone and getting the elderly people to use their bicycles, that's uh, that's a little little bit fantastic. Okay, so what do you expect from us tonight? An approval of what? Now, this is just an introduction of the study, and we will come back next year with additional workshops. And at some sometime in the future, uh, we will come back to the council to consider adopting the plan, the concept of the plan. Tonight is just merely an introduction so that you're aware of the types of things that we're working on. Okay. And that's staying at $10,000 for you for all these years? It's, until it's less than $10,000, sir. Than 10, and most of the work is being done through the departments within the city at no additional cost. And I hope you're coming back to council. <coughs> yes, yes, that's as Mr. Charette has indicated, and our plan is to bring back further uh, presentations and workshops, but we wanted you to be aware 
of what the Planning Commission and the Department has been working on today. Yeah, um, to answer Mr. Lance, you know, I'm an older guy, but I still bicycle. And down in Florida, 776 is a major highway, and they have the delineated areas that you bike on on a major highway. <laughs> Uh, to the beaches, I'm talking about Michigan. I'm not talking yeah, about Florida. Well, cars, cars, cars in Florida. It's different. Well, the roadways are different. Different size, different width. If you drove on 776, it would probably be like the highway. <laughs> <laughs> or the south of the road. Anyways, uh, my, uh, uh, I wanted to know, we did a bike study some time ago. Um, matter of fact, I had, I don't know if I gave that to you too, no, you uh, big signs to bike path. And, and, and years ago when they were doing that, they did cur curb cuts so that when there were bike paths, uh, we would do curb cuts. Um, however, under the new regs, I think we do curb cuts everywhere <coughs> under new construction. So everything now is is uh, doable if you're riding a bike. Um, the um, plan is, is necessary. I just wondered how this correlates with the previous plan that we did. I don't know. It must have been under the Parks and Recreation uh, or someone, but you should have copies of that. Um, the um, bike path, uh, to me, uh, not only need to be uh, doing the construction of new roadways, but when they are done, they should have destination points. In other words, like I was looking at that, Inglewood Park is one of the probably most widely used parks in the city uh, uh, for young families. And there's two schools uh, between uh, Lasher Road and Evergreen that cross uh, the street to the park quite often. And uh, looking at the way they cross, there's a light there at, at Inglewood Park. <coughs> but how do we work with the county? Do they do they approve these strips on cut? Uh, most of the roadways, major roadways, are either county or state in the city. The Inkster and Inkster Beach and and uh, and Evergreen are the only city streets that we have. Major streets, the rest are all county or state roads. Uh, and uh, we have an area, for example, that Ken's favorite school, <laughs> Bedford Academy, where they <laughs> go across Telegraph Road uh, on horseback or something. I don't know. They uh, that's a dangerous situation. I think that's one of the things that that I think they have as a as a thing to look at is because they go from East East Telegraph over across to Western Telegraph is get a breath of wind in the median and then head across the street again. But I think those are great things to happen. Um, and uh, if it's done with a, a plan where you know, we are making sure that people uh, can get to one of our destination points readily and, uh, and um, make use of them and not just to have them. Uh, and we get proper approvals and maybe some consideration as far as funding from our county road commission or state. Uh, that telegraph road was just completed. Could have had you know, that kind of a plan in place that would have maybe created those areas. But anyway, it's a good plan. It's a, you know, everybody's doing it now and, and uh, but they have to be made safe and uh, and have to work within the the construction portions that we uh, work on. Right. If, if not, if not just those is to check and see what areas have already been completed like like uh, Inkster Road, Franklin Road, Telegraph Road, those uh, ten mile road that have been recently uh, been built and see what improvements we can make on those as far as biking and pedestrian walkways. Yes, through the chair, Mr. Prakasi. Um, the complete streets legislation which was passed by Lansing 
requires at least agencies to consider all avenues. And so having the plan in place gives us more weight early on in the process when the County Road Commission and the, and the state comes in to um, make improvements in our community uh, that they, they have to more strongly consider those things and then there's an opportunity to look for additional funding to help implement some of those. So having the plan in place gives us a stronger position to negotiate with. So I agree. Yes. <laughs> I wouldn't be on a bicycle on Telegraph Road if you paid me the bicycle <laughs> on Telegraph Road. <laughs> or on Ten Mile Road. On that type of road. <laughs> this, this is this is dreamland. Well, through the chair, I, I just I want to point out one situation. Kamal, uh, the, uh, the the large business there on, on South Telegraph, they have properties on both sides of the street, and surprisingly enough, they have dozens, if not hundreds, of their employees that run across the street uh, all day, getting from one building to the next, and, and trying to get to meetings and so forth. On a bicycle? Not on bicycles, but that's that gets back to the pedestrian crossing and providing a safe crossing. Right now, they're just running across traffic because there's no safe harbor in the island and there's no mid-block <coughs> crossings. So that's another example where this study would help uh, look at situations and, and possibly uh, warrant some improvement. Well, that, that would be fine. That's okay. That I think the other asset... There are good concepts for this bill. I'm not denying the concept at all. The other asset to look at is our uh, Rouge Corridor. And we, we have that beautiful greenway that connects 12 miles down to 10 miles. And that's another opportunity for off-road um, bicycle and pedestrian improvements. We can get underneath 696. That's a, a natural um, north-south connector that could link up to the 12-mile bike path. I ride my horse there. You can ride your horse there, too. Yeah, um, I think this is right on time, maybe even late. Uh, as uh, Ken said, that when we were at the Michigan Municipal League, when I was at the National League of Cities, they, they're pushing the sense of place. The uh, we're losing our young people because they're going to places uh, where they can get around in different ways than always driving a car. But things that uh, places that uh, for accommodation that they can get to with bicycle or walking or, or mass transportation. Um, so I think this is this is appropriate subject to talk about. Um, one of the one of the questions I have for you, Mr. Cox, is: Do you recommend uh, mixing pedestrians and bicycles on sidewalks? Mr. Chair, uh, it depends. Uh, one of the things when you start being a lot, it depends on how many people are using it. Uh, like I said in the presentation, there can be some serious conflicts between bicycles and pedestrians. So bicycles could be going 18, 20 miles an hour down the sidewalk, and when you add up the mass and the speed, when they hit a pedestrian, pedestrians again end up in the hospital. Uh, so what we try to do is discourage fast riding on the sidewalks. Understand that children and uh, adults who don't want to mix the roadway will still be on the sidewalk sometimes and going slower, but really underscore that when you're biking on the sidewalk, it is at a slower space and the pedestrians have the right of way. And for those bicyclists who want to get out and fly, then you have the bike lanes and separated from the pedestrians. Uh, on a pathway itself, it all depends on how much use you're going to have. If it's a really high density area, there are places where you separate the bicyclists from pedestrians. But our experience is if you don't have the volumes, people kind of ignore the recommendations of where they go. Okay. Um, in some of our neighborhoods, in fact, a lot of our neighborhoods, the streets are fairly narrow. Uh, if you park a car on either side, the car that is trying to get through has to be fairly careful because there's not an awful lot of wiggle room to get through. In those, and in those, a lot of those neighborhoods, they don't have sidewalks. So 
I would imagine that it would be everybody for themselves in those because you couldn't you couldn't uh, dedicate a, a bike lane on those kind of uh, streets because there wouldn't be any room for the automobile traffic to get up and down the street. So I imagine that everybody has to kind of watch out for themselves on on those narrow streets. The chair. Yes, when you have a residential road and the speed limit is 25 miles an hour, the difference between how the speed of someone biking and driving, they can actually work together without any special facilities. The bike lanes are something more when you get into the 30, 35 mile an hour roadways. And the situation described by the two cars making it only one car could pass, um, I call that traffic calming. Uh, it's a way the speed is going a little bit slower and that actually may make it better for the pedestrians and the bicyclists rather than worse. It's the 30 some, mi 30 some feet wide open right. when people start racing down the residential roads. Okay. If I could add, Go ahead. Uh, what we found in our workshops and, and the one public uh, input session that we had, those that do live here and ride their bikes already know where some of those routes exist because they want to get away from the heavy traffic. So they're already finding those those local roads to get from one mile road to the next. What the, uh, Mr. Cox is is indicating that that might be appropriate for just signage, so that you can get to the main road without doing anything else. And those other um, more heavily trafficked local roads, the, the the type of progression of traffic calming measures could be added over time. Okay. Now I think um, I think it's a good good idea, but I think what we need to do immediately is to start having bicycle education um, and you know years and years ago we used to have uh, bicycle rodeos where uh, young kids would bring their bikes in this area and the police would show them how to properly ride the bicycle and how to go you know go through cones traffic cones and all that kind of thing but there's a uh, some rules that I think bicyclists need to understand when they start mixing with with traffic. Uh, also, the automobile drivers need to find out. They need to understand uh, that there are going to be bicycles on the road too. Um, and I know today it's not unusual to be stopping at a traffic signal and have cars go right by you after the lights red. So they run red lights on a regular basis. Here's here's a thing that really concerns me with bicyclists here in Southfield right now. At night, there are bicycles with no lights, no reflectors, wearing dark clothes, uh, and the moon's not out. Driving <laughs> down the down the street, and that's pretty risky. Uh, somehow or another, and I don't I don't think we need any more laws. Maybe we do, but. I think that <coughs> I think we need to educate folks that are going to ride bicycles how to properly equip their bicycles so that they can be seen with reflectors and and lights and, and whatever. Uh, because if more and more people just buy a bicycle and start riding, uh, it's gonna it's gonna put more dots on that one map that, map that you have. But the bottom line is, this council really has to change our thought process about where do we want to go from here to the future when we understand the sense of place. We can't continue to keep doing, making decisions that we've been making for the last 20 years, mm -hmm. or else our young people are going to be moving away in, in buses rather than in cars. Uh, so we have to make it friendly for people and, and make it attractive to attract uh, young people to come back to Southfield and stay in Southfield if they're already here. So. Through the chair? Yes. If I could respond to Mr. Frazier. Um, and education is one of those important implementation tools that be part of this plan. And we are aware of a, no a number of communities working with the police department on education, the types of rodeos and events that I, I participated in as a young adult and a child uh, getting certificates, but the, they are actually uh, what they call ticket incentives where police officers who are observing good behavior, people wearing helmets, 
working with the local businesses actually give out a coupon for free ice cream or a coupon for some nominal thing to reward good behavior. And, and that has been you know, instituted in a lot of communities in a successful way. Um, when I was out in Schaumburg, Illinois, uh, visiting my family when I was a teenager, I was writing apparently not uh, properly, and two teenagers wearing vests came up to me, and they were part of the bike patrol, and they were there to encourage, you know, just in a friendly way, that I was riding on the wrong side of the street. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of education programs working with the school district, working with um, the police department and others that we can institute. Yeah, whether this goes any further or not, that still, I think, is a... Is something that we need to do is educate the people that are already riding bicycles on how to do it properly. So it reduces the, the opportunity or the, <coughs> the incidence of, of getting into the accident. And the last thing I want to say is, years ago, I think the council talked about uh, when we were putting sidewalks in, there are some neighborhoods that have gaps in the sidewalks that we, when we were going to do street work and all that, we were going to uh, and fill those sidewalks to make a, a complete sidewalk. I don't think it ever happened, but if we're going to encourage more bicycle riding, I think we need to take a look at that. As we're planning any street improvements to uh, 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 fill in the, the gaps so that uh, uh, people aren't riding down and then darting up the street and then back up on the, on the sidewalk. All right, through the chair. Uh, again, that's, that's a good point. By having the plan in place, as we get development and redevelopment, sometimes we can share that burden of the cost to the local developer. Instead of putting a five-foot sidewalk in, a concrete sidewalk maybe puts an eight or ten-foot asphalt wide pathway along the mile roads. And if it's part of a bigger master plan, then once you get 80, 90 percent of the infrastructure, and then the city might be able to come in and, and complete that system. Yeah. Uh, uh, also, uh, I of what the council favor is suggesting, uh, we'll make sure that public works is at the table. Uh, you know, with later presentation of this plan so that there's an integration. For example, the sidewalk gaps uh, and some other things that I know that um, input for public works would be, would be essential. And, and I could say, Mr. Charette, for the chair, that um, public works did participate in, in our workshop as well as other key department heads. So um, I appreciate the having, uh, you know, a team team approach to this. Uh, on the final presentation, I think we will have the members of Public Works uh, you know, in, in, in attendance. But it's a, it's a, a good concept. Uh, the, the fact that uh, you know, efficiencies are working on it is a comprehensive approach. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Yeah, that was a good question, though.
person to walk around where to face Nine Mile Evergreen. Um, I have a bicycle. I ride on the sidewalk. Um, and I usually don't encounter any pedestrians. Uh, if I do, I stop my bike. But um, at this point, I wouldn't be riding uh, my bike on Nine Mile Road.
terms of the review. So I'd like to have a little bit more time to bring it back uh, uh, on the uh, as well. A little bit more time to, to review this with the auditors. There's been a lot of changes in accounting rules in the draft of 54 Governmental Accounting Standards Board.
um, trio in Detroit, in Metro Detroit. And we also have the KDJ Trio, which is um, a group of um, young people, 6th to 8th grade, who will be our entertainer, entertainers coming in for one set and leaving. So they will not be there for, um, to uh, mingle with the adults. They will come and go. Um, and we also have <coughs> Frank Lee. All of these performers are nationally known and have their own recordings. So we hope that you can come and share with us. Tickets are available by calling 248-395-9663. And the, the date is a Saturday. It is a Saturday okay. from 5 to 8.30. You know, if we, we have our next meeting on December 12th, you could come and make an announcement of this so that more people could uh, know okay. about it if you'd like to do that. I would like to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you for your support. Linda, the phone number again? It's 248 <laughs> Three nine five nine six six three. And how much is the ticket? The ticket started at thirty and it's fifty dollars for a couple. So you get a price rate. And anything about that that you'd like to go with? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Why don't you make the announcement that you send out the emails to all the councils and buy advertisements in your Yes, we did send out the announcement to um, City Council, and we've got um, a few returns. So thank you very much, Mr. Moss and Mr. Frazier. And we look forward to receiving others. So um, we have ad contracts <laughs> for our book for um, they, from $20 to $60. So it's not that expensive. We hope to fill our book. And our deadline is December 10th. Where did you see that? I never did. I didn't um, I just saw the, we'll send out reminders, but we did send one to everybody. To first initial, last name, city of Southfield? Yeah. Okay, we'll send it again. Sorry about that. Doesn't, doesn't help you out Okay. Sometimes I get for Cassie's mail, I don't give it to them. <laughs> 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 Thank you. You <laughs> keep the money, huh? Send your email, yes, I hear you. Hang on, I just want to listen to the ground.